about a month ago, an evangelical friend of mine sent me a link to Dell Tackett's Seven Threats in Our Times. I went through it and really liked what I saw. It's a seven different threats to mostly the U.S. and the West and to the church, to Christianity as a whole. Really liked it, read through it, ate it all up. Turns out that uh, a week or two later, I was at an evangelical event, and there was Del Tackett. Finding out who he was uh, at a breakfast, I specifically went over, brought my wife with me, and sat down right next to him so that I could talk to him about what I had read and, and what he had discussed with these seven threats. We had a really good discussion, had breakfast together, and I could tell that he had a similar idea and, and point of view on these different threats, on what was happening with these new ideologies that were pervasively seeping into the fabric and the institutions of the United States. So I followed up with him. We got together. I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but we ended up deciding that we were going to take his seven threats and make a series out of these on Quick Show. So he was gracious enough to give us his time and to go through these interviews on these seven threats. Each of these seven episodes is one of his seven threats that he talks about, the seven threats in our times. When I sat down with Dell at that breakfast, I learned very quickly that he is a sincere, humble, and very knowledgeable person. I learned later about his background. Let me just go over, by way of introduction, a few of the points about Dell Tackett. He served 20 years in the Air Force. He has his doctorate in management and computer science. In the George H. Bush administration, he served as Director of Technical Planning for the National Security Council. He was the Senior Vice President for Focus on the Family. He led the team that developed a critical command and control system for NORAD in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado. He created the Focus on the Family's The Truth Project, a worldview curriculum estimated to have been seen by over 12 million people worldwide. He's also the founder, one of the founders of the New Geneva Theological Seminary, and he currently teaches as an adjunct professor for the Alliance Defending Freedom. I hope that you'll watch not just this first episode on threat number one, but that you'll follow through the series and view or listen to all seven episodes. Dell is a gem, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have these conversations with him and to collaborate on this effort. Enjoy. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, this is the first of a seven-part series that we are doing with Dell Tackett on his seven threats uh, in our times to society and to culture. Dell, welcome to the program. Great. Happy to be here, Greg. Thanks. Dell, we had uh, sat down at a breakfast at an event a couple of weeks ago <laughs> and talked a little bit about things, uh, about culture. We have some similar ideas and and thoughts about what's going on. Uh, I think the talk we were listening to was about the culture and things that have changed so much. Your threats here, Some uh, uh, a, a friend of ours sent this to me a couple of weeks before we had met, and I had gone over them. I was really impressed in the way that you had put this together. So I thought it would be a great thing to do this seven-part series uh, on these threats and talk about them from the author with your background and uh, just let the audience really absorb what you have to say. Before we go into that, will you just give us a little bit of a background of who you are and uh, how you've come to this point of where you are today? <laughs> well, I, that's uh, a little bit have to do just simply because my life has been uh, such a yo-yo, I guess you could say. I was raised in Idaho uh, and then uh, uh, moved out my, my, between my junior and senior year. Uh, but then that started a process of me eventually going into the Air Force. I served 20 years in the Air Force. Um, then I found myself appointed to a position in the White House under uh, George Bush one. And it was there that the Lord really uh, began to break my heart, uh, first of all, for the state of our nation, and then second of all, for the body of Christ. And uh, so I left there. I left the White House uh, with what I be believed was God's call on my life to do everything I could uh, to get the body of Christ healthy, because I felt like that 
was the solution to help getting the nation back on track as well. And uh, so I've been uh, I've been working in the area of Christian worldview since then because I felt like that was the first thing that had to happen. I think it's critical for um, the people of God to have that fundamental biblical worldview, comprehensive, systematic biblical worldview. Uh, and now the, the next step after that is uh, just how we engage with the people around us. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, let's get into your, your first threat here. The first threat is the rise of the scoffer and the, the, the uh, depraved mind. And I like the way you go into this. You, you talk of this succession, uh, starting with, with a, a, ver, a verse from uh, the Bible with Proverbs one twenty two. Here's how it goes. It says, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge. And you take this scripture and you're applying it to today, what's happening in our society today with these three different types of people. Can you yes. break that down a little bit more for us? Sure. I, if you look at uh, Proverbs, and, and I appreciate you reading that passage, uh, because we have in that one uh, verse, all three of these people uh, there are three, yay, four people that are dressed in Proverbs. That's the three that you talked about, um, the simple-minded, the fool, and then the scoffer. And, of course, that is bounced against the, the wise, the one who has wisdom, God's, God's wisdom. And there is a progression, it appears, in Proverbs from these three. You begin with the simple-minded. Uh, I think of that in terms of our own culture that uh, takes us back to the 60s. Uh, the simple-minded is the person who says, I'm okay, you're okay. You know, that, hey, you know, everybody's cool, you know, uh, whatever, you, whatever you want, wherever you believe. Uh, that's a simple-minded. And then, the, the, but the simple-minded then will progress, if they are encouraged, <laughs> they will progress in uh, to what Proverbs calls the fool. Uh, and the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So the fool begins to take an open stand against God, against absolutes, uh, and he begins to take that position. He hates knowledge, uh, but he still is not, um, he's still not a militant fool, and that's reserved for this third phase, uh, which I think we're in now, the Proverbs calls it the scoffer. Um, Proverbs says that the scoffer will set the city ablaze, uh, and other descriptions about the scoffer that I think describe a lot of what we see happening today. This is the militant fool. Uh, this is the fool that is no longer uh, willing to be tolerant. Uh, this is the individual who now is going to force you in some way. Um, however, that power can be garnered to force you into accepting, affirming, believing um uh, the scoffer's position. So in this progression, one thing I, I find that's interesting, you write about the fool, and you say that he hates truth and the knowledge of God. He rejects it in favor of whatever gathers, whatever he gathers from the world. Today, there are there are so many pernicious ideologies mm -hmm. that are especially coming into the West, the United States. And it seems to me that as, as we know, religiosity is dropping, secularism is increasing at a fairly good clip, unfortunately. It seems that as human beings, we need something to believe in. We need something to grab onto. And, and when we reject God, when we move away from that anchor, aren't we naturally going to look for another anchor? Yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, we talk sometimes about what happens when we lose that larger perspective, the larger story of God, uh, understanding who he is as the creator of all things. Uh, he is uh, He's the author of history. He is the sovereign God, uh, and uh, he is the one to whom we will give an account uh, one day. When you reject that story, that larger story of God, then the only real story that is left is my own personal story. And so I get, uh, I become so invested. In fact, that's the second uh, threat that we'll deal with next time is uh, the rise of Homo Deus, where the individual increasingly becomes uh, so self-centered and so affirmed in that self-centeredness 
uh, that we begin to believe that we're divine, that we have the right to speak uh, divine uh, proclamations about who I am and my identity and so forth. And uh, But losing also, when we lose the the absolute understanding of what is right and what is wrong, then uh, we will descend into uh, might makes right, and I will do everything I can to garner the power that will allow me to uh, to assert my decision of what is right. And, and the scoffer, for example, and uh, what we're going to get to here shortly is the is the progression in Romans that leads to the depraved mind, but that leads an individual then uh, to be a militant, uh, um, one who who will try to force people. Uh, the, the idea of tolerance is way, way, way behind us. Uh, the, the idea of tolerance was back in the fool and uh, in the simple-minded day. Uh, there is no longer tolerance anymore. Uh, there is a there is a militant form of this, and I think that's part of that progression in Proverbs and also the progression we see in, in the book of Romans. You know, what's interesting, Del, is it's it, there is a progression, and that's what I really liked about what you said here. It, it is, and, and it's both individual and it's social, right? It's 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 also the people that gather toward these ideologies and 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 anchors uh, you know outside of god where where this is a natural thing not everybody but it it is overall a general arc that that we can see happening and and it's it's kind of like okay especially someone who maybe was at least agnostic or or had a belief in god as, as they start to move away from that and lower the value of those those absolute truths and order, right? And and God, they they lower this and they raise these other ideas from the world up higher and, and grab onto them. It seems like there's a change sometimes in their their heart and their mind. And and to move from not just being a fool where you've rejected God, right? Because you're you're rejecting truth when you do that, but to move to the point of a scoffer. Where there's almost this sense that I have to do this, I must do this. I've got a, uh, you're, you're sinking into some type of. You even mentioned, I think, a spiral that that mm-hmm. sets you your own self aflame in in wanting to put it down, in wanting to go against perhaps what you may have believed in before. Uh, you don't usually see that the other side, the other way, when someone accepts Christ and goes goes to order and God, you don't see so much the scoffing going right. back the other way. But when they leave God, and and it, there is a... Why do you think that is? Why is there that feeling of, now I'm going to go against this? Mm-hmm. I think part of it, Greg, is caught up in what I believe is one of the deepest uh, drives that the, the human spirit has, and that is a drive to be significant. Uh, a drive to be someone. And when you deny God, when you walk away from God, where we find the only true significance we can find, the, the creator God who has care for me, who loves me, that's where I find all of my significance, the grace that he extends to me. When I reject all of that, then I am left in a position of trying to find my own significance. And I, I will find that significance in all kinds of different ways. I'll try to find it by being the uh, the most handsome person, the strongest person, the most powerful person, uh, the wealthiest person, the funniest person, um, the, the prettiest person, whatever it is, you know, the fastest person on the field, the, the best quarterback. That significance is a drive and we find this over and over again. I, I, there is an article, I think it's been written maybe 20 years ago, but it was a great title. And the title was Affirming Ourself to Death. And, and this is the drive that, that <clears throat> not only am I going to think that, you know, my identity or whatever, I want you to affirm that because your affirmation of me then gives me significance. If you don't affirm me, that cuts my significance, and I will and I will 
hate you because of that. I will be, I will become militant. You know, I will burn cities down because of that. Uh, so the, to me, this is one of the fundamental drives that is happening, or you see it throughout all of these threats. Um, you see it also in this next progression in, in Romans. You know, I've studied a number of these ideologies for about 11 years now. I started really looking into these things back in 2012 and seeing what was happening on campuses and this really strong social shift that started to happen really with the iPhone and and with, with social media is where it really began. But it's uh, there is a, a seemingly um, you, you talk about the desire to be significant and, and these scoffers in these ideologies and every one of them embedded pregnant in the ideology is not just accepting the ideology. It is praxis. It is, it is activism. And, and it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like the ideology and the desire for significance then are, are a perfect unfortunate match <laughs> for they are. for going out and trying to scoff, right? And go back against order, go back against truth. And it's just really interesting that that activism and that, you know, what they call praxis in those ideologies and critical social justice is, is a part of what they do. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, I want you to feel significant. Here's how we're going to make you feel significant. Right. And I, I think you will find that thread through all of these, all of these threats. And it's it's behind the what I believe is the demonic worldview. I think whatever that is, number four or five in our in our threats, uh, because it plays on that. And I think because uh, it has that demonic um, basis to it, it understands human nature, and um, that's what's happening today: pitting people against each other. So if I can make you think that those people don't affirm you, uh, then I can stir up hatred in you towards that person. And the more you begin to hate that person, and this person feels like their significance is hurt because you hate them, uh, they will hate you back. And so th this is all part of the demonic process of uh, kind of like uh, judo, of using this trait of, of humanity, which I, I believe was given to us by God, because, because God fulfills that in us. He is the one who satisfies our longing to be someone uh, and when God does that, when he reaches down and graciously uh, puts his arms around us, there can be no more significance anywhere. But you cut yourself off from that, and then you find yourself in this desperate struggle, you know, to gain significance, become a manipulator of other people and all sorts of things. It's a, a, it's a death spiral. You know, it's it also, it, when you break that off, that relationship with God, and you're breaking off a part of that significance is understanding your identity, right? Yes. It's your identity. It's I am a child of God. I am bound to Christ, right? And I've I've got this identity that is there mm -hmm. that now I am I am lowering that identity. So now, what is my new identity? Who am I? Right you know, at that point, it it, it seems, and, and we will desperately try to find an identity uh, that will give us that significance. And uh, that's what's so crazy. And of course, that's the depraved mind that we're going to get to here pretty soon. But that's what's so crazy about what is happening here, because the reality is you cannot get that significance, no matter what you do, even if you can uh, get uh, the government to force people to do that. It is shallow. It does not last. Um, you know, it just it fades away rapidly. And, and then you're after more. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it really is a demonic thing, uh, and uh, it, it will destroy not only people's lives, but it will destroy our nation's life. Now, another strain of these ideologies that's always been there is, is something that's called liberation. And it's uh, ultimately, it is a liberation in my mind, when you look at it, to true order, to truth, to God. It is throwing off the shackles of, of um, you know, trying to follow truth and having to stay on a certain path. And part of that, and it's always been part of this ideology, it's, it's really interesting to see when you go back through the DNA of the philosophers and those that have come up with uh, all of these 
social justice ideologies, et cetera. But part of that has always been sexual impurity mm-hmm. and, and this liberation of who you are sexually. And, and this is what you talk about with, with the, uh, the depraved mind yes. if you have here. You say the Greek word for depraved is, I'm going to get this wrong, ad- adokimon, I think it's adokimon, adokimon yeah, and it means unqualified. Why don't you talk right. to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So just as we see this uh, progression or regression in Proverbs, we see the same thing in Romans chapter 1. Uh, it begins with a people, and it's, it, it appears to be addressing more than just an individual. It, it is addressing a people, a culture, that when a culture uh, reject God, they reject the truth of God, then uh, we have three times this phrase given to us in Romans 1. God then gives them over to. And the first one he gives them over to is sexual impurity. Uh, these, these words involve um, the defacing of the male-female sexual relationship. This is sexual impurity associated with the male-female relationship. And then the next progression, if if people do not repent, and I think part of it is God giving them over to sexual impurity that there might be a change, he then gives them over, the, the scripture says he gives them over then to shameful lusts. And this is outside of now the male-female sexual relationship. This involves homosexuality and all of the other things that are listed there in Romans 1 uh, associated with di- distorting the male-female and now um, uh, pursuing other kind of, of sexual, um, shameful, shameful lust. And the third one is that if, if the culture does not uh, repent, then God gives them over to a depraved mind. This is a dokimon. And as, as you said, it means unqualified. Um, I, I flew out to California because I wanted to spend some time with a gentleman, I, a good friend of mine that I believe is one of the great Greek scholars that we have today. And I wanted to talk to him about this word and what does this mean? Um, In other words, if you were to sit down next to someone who had a depraved mind uh, from this biblical perspective, would you know it? You know, would they be frothing at the mouth? You know, Um, what would it look like? And in our discussions, uh, the, Dr. Paul Fowler is talking about the the word meaning unqualified, and and it's a word that is also used in terms of a metal that is no longer that metal. And so the mind, if you think about what God has given to us, it's an amazing thing. It's a mind that can respond to God when He says, uh, "Come, let us reason together." Uh, God is yeah. a God of reason. He is a God of logic. Uh, throughout the, all the scripture, we are laid before us logic things. That's what uh, the children of Israel, when they came into the promised land, uh, they were divided into two groups before Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And before one, they were read the blessings that would come to them if they would follow God. And in front of the other, these are the curses that would befall you if you did. So this is an if then logic. Uh, Paul is filled with this. The scripture is filled with this. Why? Because God. Uh, is a logical God, reasonable God, common sense. He's given that to us, and our mind is is qualified. It's sound when we think logically, when we have common sense. We see this, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar when uh, he got too big for his britches? Uh, and I often think how wonderful it'd be if God would do the same for kings <laughs> who get too big for their britches. But he was an out out of his mind, uh, eating grass like a cow, until the scripture says he came to his senses. And so this is this third stage that we see in Romans 1, where God begins to give the people over to a depraved mind. It means that they no longer can think logically, especially when it comes to right and wrong um, common sense. How often do we look at what's happening today and say, this is absolutely crazy? Uh, and I think the only way to understand what's happening is, is in that perspective. So from if we step back again and look at, uh, as we did with the, the Proverbs uh, progression or regression, if you think about America, America, even though we had, we had some problems and so forth, but we had a very 
solid biblical worldview in America. Uh, up, up until about the um, the turn of the century from 1800s to 1900s, if we talk about sexuality, yes, we had brothels and so forth, but we knew they were wrong. And people understood what was right and wrong when it came to male-female relationships until the 1900s, and then it began to change. Um, Dewey and, and Darwin and, and um, uh, who's a psychologist that... Uh, oh. Yeah, Freud. So we began to change all of a sudden our perspective on right and wrong when it came to male and female. And that could well be that first stage where God began to give us over to sexual impurity. And that lasted up until, you know, the 1960s and it it began to flower then. But then how rapidly it changed when all of a sudden we flipped in terms of being given over to... um, to uh, to the to that next stage, and uh, it, it took us by I mean breathlessly. I mean we all of a sudden begin to realize we wake up one day and all of a sudden uh, these these uh, impure lusts uh, have now become mainstream in our culture, um, and then uh, I think as we're seeing right now uh, in this stage where people are, are giving over to a depraved mind. Uh, people are beginning to do things that are just absolutely bizarre. Um, and so that's where I, I think we are. That's just my assessment, but I I think it's what uh, helps us assess and understand what is happening in our culture. And, and it drives us then uh, to how we should be responding. And that's a good point. That's what I was going to follow up with. You say how we should re- be responding. And par- a big part of these ideologies today is an infusion of, of, of a certain philosophy called postmodernism, where there is a, a breakdown of truth, right? There's no absolute truth. It is your truth, as you've said. It's my truth, whoever's truth. And then all that matters is a power game. Who's, whose truth is going to win, right? Because there's no central absolute truth with that. If we can no longer reason together with those individuals, right, that have moved from into, into the fool and then into the scoffer, how do we now approach this? Because this postmodernism, it, it it gets rid of all logic. It takes it all away. It is it is a, a lived experience thing. This is my experience. These are my thoughts. These are my feelings. And this is what is true to me. How, how do you work with that? You've talked about Christian apologetics has been, you know, based on this idea of reason and logic. Mm-hmm. Do we need to move beyond that at this point? Well, I think we have to confront ourselves with uh, the reality that what might have been wise uh, in the past is no longer wise. Because speaking from uh, strictly from just an evangelical perspective here of how we used to approach uh, people uh, with our apologetic, with our logic. So we would lay out our logic for people and we would think that a logical person would look at that logic and would say, well, yes, I, you know, you've made a great point. I, you know, you won me over. Uh, And by the way, just as an aside, I remember when I was at the White House, I I was reading everything I could about the founding generation. And I realized uh, all of a sudden that they argued so differently than we do. Mm. Uh, Because back then, uh, when they argued, they both listened in other words, I would listen <laughs> to your perspective, and you would listen to my perspective, and I might comment and say, you know, that's a really good point. Uh, and the reason was, it dawned on me, the reason, because they both wanted to obtain the truth. And, and so if your logic was helping me understand that I was thinking wrong, I wanted to know that. But now that's, we don't do that today. Mm-hmm. Now it's all about winning. Uh, it's all about defeating the other person. Well, when you no longer have that logical mind, then the old approach of just laying out the logic in front of someone, assuming they have a logical mind to understand that, may no longer be wise to do so. Uh, And so that is why I think uh, we're dealing with a spiritual issue, a spiritual problem, and that is why I think we're going to have to lead with building a relationship, praying with people, 
uh, to the point where all of a sudden that friendship will then allow us to begin to talk to them. They will then feel free to ask questions. Uh, but God is the one I think is going to have to release people from the depraved mind. And have them come to their senses. Yes. I want to I want to end with this, Dell. There was a a Wall Street Journal poll that came out earlier this month, March 2023. And there are five uh five segments here that it five five graphs that it goes over. Here's the question it asks. It says the percent who say that these values are very important to them. And he gives three different years on this, which is fascinating. It's 1998. 2019, and then today in March 2023. First one is patriotism. And so in 1998, 70% said this was very important, dropping to 2019, 61%. So a 9% drop. You'd say, okay, well, that's a little concerning. But then from 2019 to 2023, it drops all the way down to 38%. And keep in mind, what we have in 2019 is... You've got George Floyd in there around that time, and then you've got COVID. You've got these two major events that came through and and really apparently have transformed mm-hmm. a lot of our attitudes here in the U.S. Number two, religion. 62% in 1998 said that it was very important to them. 48%, that's already a pretty big drop. Maybe we were already soft in the belly for what happened in 2019. And then down to 39% now. So we are down to 39% that say religion is very important to them in the U.S. Number three, having children. 59% in 98, 43% in 2019, 30% in 2023. Community involvement. This one's interesting. 47% in 1998, it went all the way up to 62%. In 2019, 27% in, now I I would imagine COVID had a a major impact on on that, 27% today. And the last one is money. The importance of money in your life, is it very important? That went from 31% in 98, 41% in uh, uh, 2019, and now 43% in 2023. So all of the others have moved drastically down. You you got the importance of money moving up here. And it kind of goes back to what we started off with here is when you lose the anchor Mm -hmm. of God and truth and order, then you're, these things just are not going to be as important to you. And, and, and you, you know, even if you haven't moved to that scoffer place yet, you're sitting in that place of being the fool, which we'll call someone who's rejecting God. Right then, then, then all of a sudden, what happens to society? How does it start breaking? Look at the family. Look what is happening to our family today. These families that are breaking down the marriage and 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 the kids and and the amount of kids and the disintegration of the family is really very very concerning in our society today. Yeah. It really is. In fact, that will be our seventh. Uh, the seventh threat we'll look at is the destru- destruction of the biblical family. But, you know, every one of those that you read, um, and I think I heard that, I don't know where this come from, another survey or something was just uh, talked about, uh, was hard work, that hard work was not important anymore to um, a large, large percentage of, of people. The, all of these are symptoms, I think, of everything we've been talking about. Okay, so the more that we are absorbed in our, our own self, our own identity, the more we become dependent um, then the less we're going to want to work, uh, the less I want to have children, um, because that requ- you know children, marriage and children requires some sacrifice. It requires me to give up some of my freedom and and so forth. Um, and you know the the patriotism thing is very interesting to me. I served twenty years in the Air Force, over twenty years in the Air Force. I I went uh, to fly and fight. Uh, to I was willing to die for her, and I'm still willing to die for her. And so I, le- I love this country. But if you then, uh, through elementary school and all the way through the university, begin to tell people that America is bad, uh, then all of a sudden people are going to say, why, you know, why should I even care about this country? Uh, but, but second of all, America, from the standpoint of, of, of American patriotism and so forth, 
it was never really about um, an ethnic America. It was never really about the land. Honestly, it was about the idea. It was about this notion of liberty and freedom. It was the American dream that the individual here had the freedom to be able to pursue uh, being fruitful with hard work and so forth, regardless of who they were. So it was this ideal that I believe um, was in line with a biblical understanding of who the individual is, uh, what community is, how the, how the government, the state should look. And all of that ideal now is tossed out. Why? Because it's an ideal that is associated only with an understanding of the true God and his absolute values and truth. So, you know, we, it, those numbers are are deeply concerning, but they're not surprising. Yeah, yeah. And they they correlate with everything you're talking about here in these in these threats. Del, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Our next episode that we do will do on, is on threat number two. It is the rise of Homo Deus and Mayo Christianity. So look forward to that. Thank you for your time. You're right. You bet. God bless. Look forward to seeing you.